We do have a good number this morning. We have some that are uh, here today that weren't here last Sunday, and we're thankful for that. And as you see this opportunity that we have to worship God in spirit and in truth is something that's important to us. And it really starts our day off, actually a whole week off, right. It starts our day off and the rest of the week the right way, thinking about God and His ways in our lives today. We're going to conclude this kind of a, not say two-part lesson we talked about in our first lesson about the foolishness and how it can ruin us. It can actually ruin our lives in several ways as we looked at that, that first lesson. Now we're going to look at the lesson, Who is a Wise Man? And we talk about wise men often. You think, well, what comes to mind when you think about a wise person? Is it someone who with years and experience, or as the world thinks about it, somebody that stays up on a mountaintop and he comes in with some kind of enlightenment or like the picture here, someone who's reading books all the time, maybe in a forest and they're just so kind of an outcast or secluded from the rest of the world in order to become wise. Well, that's not the picture really of wisdom. What we find who is a wise man is really the question that the book of James, James himself asked of that question, reminding the audience that God wants us to be wise in our lives today. And I think about the book of James itself as a book of wisdom that's given to us in the New Testament. We have the Old Testament ones of, of Solomon's words and the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. But here in the New Testament, James reminds us, he says, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Again, that shows us wisdom is the application of knowledge. What we know, we put into practice so we can live according to God's word. I believe God's word is true knowledge and wisdom for us to follow today. But I want to suggest this morning that whenever we answer the gospel call, God's call of the gospel itself, that is wisdom. And we might say, well, who is a wise person? Is it the women who are wise? And I think the Bible pictures several, several of the Old Testament and the New Testament who are wise, who followed Jesus, and they, they sat like Mary sat at the foot of Jesus while her sister Martha was serving. And there are several that are mentioned as men and women coming to, to Christ in the book of Acts and how they did that. They answered the call of the gospel through gospel preaching. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 14 tells us, to this he called you through our gospel that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to think about how the gospel, you know, we answer the phone all the time, don't we? And we have to answer a phone, whether you have a cell phone or the ancient landlines of today. We was talk, I was talking about that just this past week, about someone that uh, was talking about all these cell phones that were not working, the AT&T ones because of some kind of cyber thing that happened. And, well, the problem is with cell phones, you have to have someone on the other side to answer the call. And really God is calling out to us in love and grace and mercy wanting us to have the forgiveness of our sins. And we have to answer that call. That's the gospel call of salvation. In Acts chapter 2, verse 39, on the day of Pentecost, Peter says there, for the promise is to you and your children, to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Now what he said in verse 38 is key to verse 39. What he said to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And we see people on the day of Pentecost who answer the call of salvation. The Bible says about 3,000 souls were saved that day. They were added to the Lord's church. As the Bible tells us, that's part of what we see happening in the book of Acts. Over and over, people coming to the Lord. They're answering the call of the gospel. And you know why they would do that? It's because of wisdom. Because of understanding what God is offering us we can have that today. As the beginning of the church, being of the kingdom, when God would call people into that kingdom. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, 
We're going to go to that book of Corinthians several times today. It says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the, the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Now, I put this in the lesson for this purpose. Here, Paul is reminding that people who think that they're wise, they're not answering the call, but you are. You are the ones who are answering the call to salvation. And he's really reminded of the fact that sometimes people dismiss the gospel as being foolishness, but really it's wisdom. It's wisdom to act upon what God offers us today. In Acts chapter 18, verse 8, we see what they did in answering the call. He talks about to the Corinthians. says, Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized. That's exactly what we preach today, isn't it? The same gospel message that people need to answer the call to that message. And so wisdom accepts God's way of salvation. I'm reminded about what Paul would tell Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15 about his life and his upbringing, if you will, how his grandmother and his mother both taught him the scriptures. The Bible says that from childhood, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. You know, Timothy was a wise young man for answering the call and accepting what was told him by his mother and his grandmother because truly they were helping him to obey God. And later on, he would go with Paul and would preach the gospel himself as a young man who was a preacher of the word. And that's, again, that's answering the call of the gospel. And that still happens today, doesn't it? We still see people who obey the gospel. And it may not happen every day, but we still see people who are convinced of the message of the cross and come to the Lord, our Savior. But then also... Walking in wisdom as we faithfully serve Jesus. Take your Bible, Luke chapter 12. I'm reminded of what Jesus himself said about those who are his servants. Now, in Luke chapter 12, I want to begin with verse 42. He says here, The Lord said, Who then is the faithful and sensible, or actually wise uh, steward, whom his master will put in charge of his servants, to give them their rations at the proper time. Blesses that slave whom his, fa his master finds so doing when he comes. <clears throat> Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that slave says in his heart, my master will be a long time in coming, he begins to beat the slaves, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him. In an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. Now he compares that to someone who's unwise, begins to may say in his heart, you know, I, I, I'm free, I don't have to listen to this, and I can just simply, my master's delaying his coming, and I, there's no accountability. Well, that's kind of foolish, isn't it, to do that? He compares that to someone who's wise, who's sensible, if you will, and does. Well, that's exactly what God wants of us. Right now, we're waiting. We're waiting. We're are patiently uh, waiting for the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we know that day is coming. That's a day that's on the calendar. Even though we don't know what day that is. We do know that day is coming when the Lord Jesus will come back. And so we have to answer that call and live in expectancy and hope of the return of Jesus. And I want to go back to what James talks about in James chapter 3, verse 13. That the person who's wise shows by his good conduct. You know, you don't have to say, I'm a wise man, to know that it's true. It's, it's what you, how you act. It's how you conduct yourself. That's his wisdom. And in James 3.13, that's exactly what he says there. I want to drop down to verses 17 and 18. We talked about in our first lesson, some about, about the foolishness and how the envy and strife all comes from the worldly type of wisdom. But here's God's wisdom. 
in verse 17 and 18 it says, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now, that's a lot of words that describes who you and I need to be. We need to be acting in wisdom. We need to be doing what it says there in all of this. You know, there's a lot of things that, that come to mind when we read about this. We need to know how to behave ourselves with pure motives, the purity of life that God calls us to. And I think that's, that's what the wisdom is. It's first pure. In other words, it's free from the kind of motiv motivations that's selfish in a lot of ways. He talked about those who envy and strife out of self-will and all that. That's not the kind of way God wants us to live. But he wants to be peaceable and with gentleness and, and, and all full of good works. You know, again, that's what the Christian life is all about. We are people who are zealous for good works. And that shows wisdom once we adopt that into our life and say, you know, this is who I want to be. Many times people have an identity crisis in their lives. They don't know who they are. They don't understand why I'm here, my purpose in life. But the wisdom of God shows us who we are. And it gives us purpose. It gives us a life of going about being like Jesus, doing good works. And God offers us the better way than the devil. And I think many people, if they really are honest, will admit to that, that what God offers if we look at it for face value, he's offering us the best life that you could ever live. As opposed to, to what brings chaos and all kinds of a degradation to our lives and really brings us down is a life of sin. God offers us freedom from that and a better way than the devil has. And honestly, if we follow the devil into every temptation, it actually destroys our morals. And I believe the wise people who have, have really understood that. I was watching somebody talk about that this morning, about a man who said, I didn't realize how bad I was until I got out of that life, how trapped I was, and how terrible my life was when I was doing all these things, really following the devil heartily into the sin that he offers that each and every one of us in our lives. And good conduct is the only way to have a good influence. And that's really just, just common sense, isn't it? You know, sometimes common sense isn't very common in a lot of ways. But in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, that's what Jesus says about our influence, that it has to stay good in order to have a good influence. It says, you are the salt of the earth, but the salt loses its flavor. How shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing, be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. And I think that's, again, something we know very well, that salt, if it loses its characteristic, it's simply not going to help in any way. You know, if you use salt for a preservative, it's not going to preserve anything very well. If you use it salt to, to help with the taste of food, it's going to be bland because it's lost its saltiness. And that's how we need to influence this world ourselves, not for evil, but for good. And that's really the point, isn't it? So we have to have that in our lives. And who is a wise person? Let's answer the question by saying this. It's the person who fears the Lord. And I'm not talking about bodily fear where we're in dread of God, but there is an element that we do fear the punishment. That's why in a lot of times we need to have the fear of God in our lives in order to keep us in the right way. But you know, the Bible tells the perfect love cast out all fear. Once we get to low Jesus and, and follow him more and more every day. Love is actually more powerful than that kind of fear in some ways. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 I think he's talking about when we first really start to understand. Now I think about young people oftentimes when you're young going into your teenage years you start to think about what life is all about. And I think Solomon's reminding us when you start to figure out things the first thing you need to figure out is that I need to fear the Lord. And that's where the basis of all the life with God is all about. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, Solomon tells us. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, why would he say that? That the fear of the Lord is the beginning 
of knowledge. What's the wisest thing we could ever do? It's, it's when we understand the kind of respect we need to have for God. That fear, respect, and love, and even the awe of God are needed to truly serve Him. And I believe that's why He says that for us. is because we need a sense of honoring God and loving God. Without that, you know, think about this. People who are without that will not ever truly worship God. You know, if they disrespect God, that's the opposite of really fearing Him. To give him that level of disrespect. But we are, are wise when we embrace this into our lives and say, This is what I want to be. Because Solomon, after looking at all about life, he came to this conclusion Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That's the ESV version of that. And so here we're, we're our, our man's all, if you will, the New King James. That's what we're all about, isn't it? Is the coming and realizing to the point, coming to the point we realize I need to serve God. I believe that's the wisest thing we could ever do in growing up is understanding that fully like we should. And lacking these will only hinder a relationship with God, as I mentioned already. But I want you to notice what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 9, that fools mock at sin. But among the upright, there is favor. Now, I believe he's talking about two different kinds of people. One who has a lack of respect for God. He mocks at sin, mocks at the, the guilt of sin and all that. But here's the upright who understands. Understands I can't do that. I cannot look trivially at my sins and mock at it and say it's, it's, it's just uh, something I do. And, it, and sometimes people mock at that. Like the man who, who talked about something that was very dire in his life. So, oh, I, I shouldn't have done that. And kind of laughs about it. Instead of saying, you know, I should not have done that. And actually have tears mourning for our sins. Because that's really the, the kind of, of favor we find with God. Is when we are broken hearted because of our sins. That's where favor is. When we do that. Because we're upright. And we strive to do what God wants us to do. And staying out of sin. Romans chapter 3, verse 13 to 17. Take your Bible and turn over there. I believe it's really Paul's main point in the book of Romans that we all need a Savior, that we all need this in our lives. Verse 13 says, Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. And the path of peace they have not known. And last verse, verse 18, says this. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Verse 18 really senses it all. It's not on the chart. I should have went one more verse. Verse 18 really tells us. The problem that they have is not they're doing these things, and they are doing those things. The problem is their attitude toward God led them that way. And then we can stay out of sin if we will simply fear God, and realize sin is something we don't need in our lives. We're not going to practice it. We're not going to live for it and put it far away from our lives. And the Bible also tells us that the person who wins souls to the Lord is a wise person. We get that from the scriptures. Again, Proverbs 11, verse 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. How many times have we heard this passage and think, well, What's this saying to us? It's saying to us, we are wise when we try to spread the gospel to others and try to convert people to what the Lord and His ways and His, His Word, what it teaches for us. Mark chapter 1, verse 17. Remember what Jesus said. I, I, I'd have to call the disciples who were fishermen. and They knew about all about catching fish. It was Peter and James and John. They were all partners together in the boat. They were casting their nets. And, and here Jesus, when he saw them, said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Now they understood what he was saying. He said, in another place he even tells them, you know, you catch, you'll be catching men rather than fish. In other words, your work is involved in bringing people in to God's kingdom. 
And that's exactly what they would do by their preaching, by helping people to see the truth that Jesus was, was the Savior and that men need to follow him. Now, how do we do that today? You know, we talk about like the workbook we have, preparing to teach our neighbors. Well, what does it take to teach our neighbors? Well, we are reminded by what Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 45. Here Jesus says, It's written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Now, who's the instrument in this? You know, the Bible sent us the Holy Spirit. Actually, it sent the apostles the Holy Spirit. They brought us the scriptures. We have them to thank for, like Paul brought, brought us the book of Romans and Luke, the book of Acts. We can read about what they, they give us today. And, and also, we can spread it to others. He uses us to teach others the truth of his word. It's not supernatural that people have the message within them about the Savior and that what he did for us. It's what we spread to them, what we tell them, what God has done in our lives, but also what he does in the world in saving men, reconciling us to God himself, to himself, and helping us to be saved. You know, sometimes we forget the power is not within us. It's not the power within us relying on the message. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, Paul says this. Paul says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, I said all that to say this. It's not within us how persuasive we can be. You know, all we got to do is tell people about Jesus, that he's a Savior, and how to come to him through the gospel. It's that simple, isn't it? There's no complicated rocket science about it. Oftentimes it's just telling people that there's a better way, that God has a better way, and it's through and by His Son Jesus. That's the only message we have, and it's the message of the gospel, that a crucified Savior died for us so we can be free from our sins. And that ought to appeal to everybody, but I know it doesn't. There are some people who will stay in their sins. They will not come to Jesus, but they will be lost because of that. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 18 and 19 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. That's the contrast, isn't it? There's a lot of people in the world, you talk to them about religion, they say, oh, religion is just a sham. It's not for me. I don't think I need it in my life. To those, those are the ones who are perishing. And that's exactly what Paul is saying about those during his day. You know, back in the first century when he was preaching, he met people like that who did not want and did not take an interest in the gospel of salvation. So it says, but to us who are being saved is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Now again, what is he saying there? It's the fact that those who know and understand exactly what this wisdom is all about. It's about saving ourselves from this untoward generation, like what Peter said even on the day of Pentecost. How about saving ourselves through God's way of salvation? And I also want to talk about this morning. The last point of our lessons, those who prepare are wise. You know, we mentioned the ant last week, how the ant prepares and it does all this in a physical way. You know, we have to prepare many times for all the things we do in this life. Have we prepared for eternity? We may prepare for a lot of things, prepare every day, get up for, for the get up to work and all that. But here's a story in Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. Very familiar story. But the parable of the wise, five wise and five foolish virgins. You know what the point of the story is? We don't have to read it, but we know the, the point is. Five were prepared. They had their oils. They had everything they need. They all fell asleep. But what did the foolish? They did not prepare. They did not have enough oil. 
And they were lacking in that regard. They were actually on the outside. When they all went in to meet the bridegroom, when the bridegroom called, there were five who were ready to go in. The, those who were ready went in to meet the bridegroom. But there was also five who missed their opportunity that day. And that's what we have to do. We have, we have to prepare for that. And it's intentional. It's, it's not something you'll accidentally go into. You know, heaven is not a place you'll accidentally find yourself there. You'll wake up one day, well, how did I get here? No, it's because you prepared. It's because you listened to what the gospel has to say. In Ezra chapter 7, verse 10, the Bible tells us about a man who prepared himself. You know how you prepare? It's by listening to God's word and let it lead your life. In the Old Testament, Ezra did this. The Bible says, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. You know, that attitude, even though we're not under the Old Testament law, that needs to be our attitude about the New Testament age. We need to prepare our hearts to seek the Lord and, and follow Jesus today. In 2 Chronicles chapter 19, verse 3, here they're telling the people of God to do the same thing. It says, nevertheless, good things are found in you, the Bible says, in that you have removed the wooden images from the land and have prepared your heart to seek God. Well, sometimes we have to get rid of things that will cause us not to follow God like we should. And here it was their idols. We have to get rid of sin today, don't we? That's really what Jesus asked, to deny self and take up the cross and follow Jesus, as the Bible tells us. Take your Bible over to Matthew 22. And I want to talk about, just briefly, some things about preparation. You know, when you go to a wedding, you have to prepare for that, don't you? You put on clothes. There's a certain type of attire. And I'm going to build up to that in just a moment. But in Matthew chapter 22, the Bible tells us in verse 1, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he set out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatted livestock are all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged and sent out, sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he and his slaves, and then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore in the main highways and many as you find there invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. And I want to stop there. Isn't that our job today? Is try to call people to the wedding feast. You know the Bible picture is a, as a marriage even. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5. That the people of God. The church itself. Is as a bride adorned for a husband. We're all going to be there. The book of Revelation talks about it. A great wedding feast. Preparation for that. Notice verse 11. <laughs> verse 11 shows us a different picture. He, goes, he kind of swifts gears and talks about it in verse 11. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guest, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Now, we want to call everybody to this feast, don't we? But there will be people who will be unprepared because they've not made the preparation. And I, I always thought about this man who comes to the wedding but did not have a wedding garment on. And why the reaction of the king? You know, he might have been happy just people come. No, he said this man had not prepared himself. It was a, a lack of respect in some ways, but it also shows on his part he really in some ways was not honoring the son at the wedding feast. 
And so we realize that person could be us if we're unprepared, if we've not done what we need to do to seek God and to follow Jesus like we should. You know, coming to church is good. We want everybody to come to church. It's not the end all. We want you to fully devote your heart to God's service, to do His will, to present yourself as someone who is God's servant, a servant of Jesus even. Because without that, we are not prepared like we should be. And one day we'll stand before Jesus and He'll say, well, were you my servant or were you not my servant? Finally, I want to say this last point, last verse of the lesson. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 9, he talks about here, to you who are troubled, rest with us from the Lord Jesus revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God. I want to say this, going back to Matthew 22. These are people who haven't put on the, the wedding garments. Those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only two things that's going to really matter, isn't it? Did I know God? Did I have a relationship with Him? Did I give myself to that relationship? And did I obey the gospel of our Lord and Jesus, Savior, Jesus Christ? Because why? Because the Bible says, These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. And that's how dire a consequence it is if we fail to put on the wedding garment. We put, fail to put on Christ, if you will. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 tells us, For as many as have been baptized into Christ have been clothed in Christ. That's the New American Standard rendering of that verse. You see the point, don't you? We have to put on Christ in order to be right with God. If you're here this morning, you're not a child of God, you need to be. You need to put on Christ. By faith, repentance of your sins, confession of Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and baptism into water for the remission of your sins. And there's where you put on Christ. We can help you do that this morning. Why don't you come as together we stand and we sing the song that's been selected.